Uh, our next panel, uh, we're getting a chance to look, we, we, we go from a panel you just heard from, kind of big, big, big picture, strategic uh, policy level into the micro level. And probably, I would bet, uh, all together on one stage, this doesn't happen often. Uh, you have three of our top, uh, top recognized state leaders uh, in education uh, that will visit with you for the next half hour talking about uh, what they know, what they learn, what their experiences are, and more importantly, why they are the top in their profession. Uh, this, of course, is our top teacher of the year, uh, our top principal of the year, and our top superintendent of the year. And here to introduce that panel uh, is Dr. Sam Houston. Uh, good morning again in a different role. Uh, I want to take this opportunity, Lou, to thank you and your staff for this annual education conference that features the things that are probably one of the most important things to our state and the future of our state. I think this is the largest group we've ever had, and again, thank you. Excellence will not occur at the local level without leadership, and that also is a prerequisite to say that excellent leadership enhances leadership at the local level. Now, this idea that we're here from Raleigh to help you really doesn't resonate very well in our local community. So we are going to have a great opportunity, I think, this morning to hear from some people who have achieved the best of the best awards in their different fields and who have influenced culture. Uh, it's been said, and I hate almost to say this, that culture trumps strategy. I didn't even want to use that word. <laughs> but it does. And creating a culture in the classroom, creating a culture at the school level, and creating a culture at the system level, locally, makes all of the difference as different decisions are made and people move forward. So as said, we have three of the best of the best, and I'd like for them to come on up now. Our Teacher of the Year, the Burroughs Welcome Fund North Carolina Teacher of the Year is Bobby Kavner. <laughs> the Wells Fargo Principal of the Year is Melody Chapman. <laughs> and the A. Craig Phillips Superintendent of the Year is Dr. Freddie Williams. interesting that they are all honored by business or business related industries. Uh, we appreciate what you do. And I want to thank you for the children that you've impacted. Well, many times they probably have. Uh, we're going to be talking about what works locally. What makes a difference and how have you actually optimized the opportunities in your community. Either make your school or your classroom or credit your district the best it can be. I'd like for this also to be a discussion, not just a, a question and answer. And if you don't make it that way, I'll make it that way for you. I'm going to challenge you because there are going to be some times that, that I'm going to ask how Bobby has your superintendent helped make a difference in your classroom and in your community and so on. So uh, Melody, how about we I, I let's, I let's, let's start with the classroom. Talk about your classroom and the locality and relationship with your local community. Uh, I teach in, can you hear this? No, oh, great. I teach at uh, South Point High School in Belmont, North Carolina, which is right outside of Charlotte. And although we're very close to a big city, Gaston County is traditionally a mill town. It's, uh, it's lots and lots of manufacturing mills. Um, but of course, over the past few decades, those mills have slowly closed down, and so there's a lot of need in our county, um, a lot of loss of manufacturing jobs. And my, the town I teach in is now largely sort of a bedroom community for Charlotte, but in the western part of our county, 
there's still quite a bit of need. So we're a very diverse county with very diverse needs. But I think, um, to answer your question, my superintendent has done a spectacular job, uh, Mr. Jeffrey Booker, who is regional superintendent of the year this year. Um, and he's done a spectacular job of, of reaching out to business leaders and businesses in general and building those relationships. Uh, one of the things we do locally that I think is very unusual is something called commissioner school. The county commissioners actually ask each school in the dis each high school, I'm sorry, in the district to nominate rising 10th graders. And we bring them in for a two-week residential school in which they actually are taken all around the county to see what our county has to offer them if they come back to Gaston County after going off to all of the wonderful colleges they're going to go to. They see the manufacturing plants we have. They take them down to the Duke Power Station. They take them to our you know, incredibly cutting edge, as they were talking about the last panel, manufacturing facilities to show them, as they said on that last panel, when we talk about manufacturing jobs, this is not what it was when in the mill days. What we're doing now requires incredible skill, education, and we try to show kids in our local area that there is an opportunity for growth and advancement in those areas. And I think Commissioner School is a great example of something that we can do locally to show kids what the potential of our area is. Right. Now we have about address the same issue, your relationship with your community and how it impacts your school. Well, absolutely. Hello? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Absolutely, and we're, I'm actually the principal at East Smith High School down in Fayetteville, North Carolina. So we're on the opposite end um, of Mr. Kavanaugh. And so our needs are a little bit different. Um, in Fayetteville, obviously, our biggest employer is the Fort Bragg military installation. And the school that I, I'm principal, is actually the school that the students that attend that are reside in Fort Bragg that actually attend our high school because there is no high school on base. So our needs are a little bit different down there. And one of the unique partnerships that we have started um, in our community is with the military units. Actually, every single school in Cumberland County School is partnered with the military unit on the base. And that relationship has been phenomenal. Uh, the experiences that the students can have by taking field trips, um, out on Fort Bragg to the different um, units that are there and bringing guest speakers and just having those military personnel come in and motivate the students just giving me opportunities to um, see things that they wouldn't see on a normal basis. So that's one of the unique um, things I think about the Sand Hills region and specifically Federal North Carolina. And also our superintendent has a program in our, in our system called Mentoring Works. And so we have an actual push for getting business partners, community organizations to sign up to serve as mentors in our schools. And so we try to open our doors and really streamline that process. So we're very proud of the partnerships that we have developed there in Cumberland County. And specifically um, at my high school, I can say has truly made the difference. Um, some years ago, our, our school had some challenges with, with test scores. And I can truly say that by opening our doors and asking for help and getting help and seeking help from the businesses and communities in federal, the federal area, in the local neighborhood, we've been able to turn things around and really um, have a positive impact in the lives of our students. Hope County is next door at the Cumberland. You also have an opportunity to work with a very good <coughs> audience. How do you do that and make community work for you and your relationship with business industry there. Great. Appreciate the opportunity to be with you today and to all my colleagues that serve as superintendent on the challenging work that we do every day with this state is a great state the educational system is better than it's ever been. Those partnerships and involvement of uh, one uh, for, for a school system to determine with the employment of citizens within that community within the county we are the highest largest employer there. So we see that as an obligation. So it's critical that we have partnership. We understand that we must train and that, that workforce is prepared to do those who try to do that. It's critical for parents too in that parental involvement that we see that as a partnership, not as an add-on that we need parents and more parents and demand parents. But if we form it as a partnership, I think it's critical. But there is a new definition of parental involvement. Historically, it's been that parents need to show up in the building. 
But in this digital age, we can connect now uh, through the digital devices to have that communication form those partnerships and for parents to be aware of what's going on in the building. We want a partnership with all of our employees because they need ownership in the work that we're doing. It's challenging work, it's hard work, and if we approach it from a partnership standpoint, then that means they have a voice, a very positive or critical voice, whatever the need is, and that they're valued with that. Also, we understand that approaching it from that partnership standpoint from the LEA, that there is opportunities for advancement within that system. And that's critical for employees to do that. So we do the whole operation as a partnership that comes together and work together to educate our kids. There was a time when uh, the business industry relationship with the school was started that comprised by the open hand, you know, give me something. Uh, in working with your community partners, uh, how has that changed? Well, from a teacher perspective, uh, one of the things that we've been able to do with our local businesses is actually work together in the sciences especially because we come from a very manufacturing centered area. Uh, we are not simply asking businesses to give us money to run our program. We're often asking them to give us the knowledge that they have, for example, in our robotics program. Um, a lot of times the teachers in the schools may lack the training and the knowledge that they need to be able to prepare kids. And the, we ask the businesses to come in and help us with that help train our teachers, but also we had a local business even say, we'll send you an engineer. And they sent us one and helped run that robotics program and help the robotics program compete. And that that is a partnership that I, in earlier in my career, never saw, that we have uh, a member of a local business in the school helping to teach. But that builds a, a sense of community and a sense of ownership for those businesses as well as the school. And, um, and created a, a bond between the school and that business that went far beyond money. It was, it was not just about paying for the robotic program. It wasn't what we were asking. We were asking more for experience and knowledge. That also helps us though know what that business needs in the future from us. Uh, what, what our students need to be able to do, what they need to come out with. Um, and I, I think of things like our health occupations program as well where we're sending kids into medical offices, hospitals, all of those things, and the, in exchange, they're coming into our schools and telling us this is the training that, that, our, that we need to see coming out of the same nurses aid programs. Um, those type of knowledge share is something that I did not see 15 years ago when we started and that I'm, I see more than ever now. And I can add that a great opportunity that we had this year, we had a representative from Duke Energy come to our school to give information about a minority recruitment um, initiative they had, especially for their skilled positions. And so we were we had to select about 20 or so juniors and seniors who might be interested in just learning more information about it. So that was a situation where the business came to us and said, hey, we have this opportunity. Can you give us an audience? And so we did provide the audience, and it was just so amazing um, to see the interaction with the kids because they had never interacted or worked with a line worker to be able to see what they do and have that experience. And it was very hands-on. They actually brought the line trucks out to the school. But the whole idea was not, it was, it was more than just giving them information, but the next step was, here's how you apply. This is the test that you need to take. And they gave them a sample book of what they would need to study for. They followed up with the students and actually, we actually went through the process and some of those students applied for positions. And so those students said to me, Ms. Chalmers, we would have never known about that. They would have never on their own researched that very, very unique career, especially for them. So that's, I think that's a great example of where businesses can come in and partner with the school and we're not asking for anything, but we're giving them something, a skilled worker or more more applicants for a position that otherwise those students may not have ever heard of. In addition, being at a high school, we have a very profound workforce development program. You know, Ms. Bobby um, talked about 
um, health occupations, but this year one of the courses that we added was a logistics or warehousing class, and so that's a very new curriculum um, that we're trying to bring into our school. But we didn't try to do it alone. Obviously, we brought in <coughs> experts in the community to come in and show us what books do we need, how do we set up the curriculum, what supplies do we need to order, or how do we transform this room? We actually took a room and turned it into a warehouse type of setting. Um, so it was very, very beneficial to have business come and give back in that way. And us not asking for something in that situation. I want to change that a little bit for you, Dr. Williams. Mm -hmm. um, and those of you out there, please don't misunderstand this. Uh, in, in working as a superintendent and working with superintendents, uh, if you're going to be successful, you have to control your community. Uh, <coughs> work carefully with your board make things happen, give you an opportunity to do the other things that you'd like to do. Uh, if you're the superintendent here, and one of the families, uh, the national superintendent. So uh, talk to us about what you do to, excuse the term, but manage and control your community. Management of, of situation and issues is a critical part of the leadership. Uh, we all agree that leadership now is no question, and with that comes that vision of where we can go, those needs with that. I think it's important because the planning process of a strategic plan, that vision of where we need to be, where can we be five, six years down the road? How can we prepare the workforce for the jobs? We've already made references to the change in CTE, uh, that critical need of those jobs. Now, Majority of jobs in the future are going to be service type jobs, so they will remain in the counties and in this state. The real world experiences beyond the theoretical part that we can do in classroom exists in businesses and those partnerships. Local governments, uh, county commission, they understand that economic development depends on the quality of the public education, quality of the workers, and a partnership with business and industry. Certainly, internships, um, cooperative education, all those pieces are critical. But to put that vision out there, to help them clearly understand the impact of industry coming to a county like home, if we have the workforce, if local government um, would do those things for expansion, for growth, and plan to anticipate that. So it's an opportunity to me to, to communicate, but to share that vision. I often tell folks, and it's true, that if the educational system within your county is not the lead agency, there's no opportunity for economic growth. There's no vision because, again, it runs through the education system and the students of the future. There are a lot of things that are external to the school, the classroom, and the district uh, that impact on your ability to get the job done. What's working for you to help you be successful at the classroom level, Bobby? Well, we hear often about what's not working. Um, we often hear about the sort of needs. Let me of, jump in. Talk to both. Okay. What's working for you and what's not? What's an inhibitor to keep you from one, being all you can be? One of the main inhibitors is just resources. Um, we are lacking in resources. Where often I just participated in a school resource drive to try to get enough just binders of books and pencils, pens, the basic, basic resources. If I go to the office, they will give me one expo marker because they go, that's all you get. And you can come back when that one's done, but they're not gonna give you a box because they can't spare it. So I mean, just resources like that, but also of course, wraparound resources for children, things like social workers and and uh, guidance and you know our guidance counselors spend so much time organizing testing that often they're not able to reach out to kids who need actual guidance and so th those things are, are definitely a challenge one of the things that's working though is i think um, our drive in our county towards technology uh, as much as we are lacking in resources we are doing a very good job of focusing what we have on the things that really are going to matter. And so we are we have a smart board in every classroom in Gaston County, um, thanks to a very generous gift from a private benefactor. Um, we have 
Chromebook carts, we have as much technology as we can, but what we've had to do with our lack of resources is switch to bring your own device, where students can bring their own devices into the classroom and use what they have. And we've scrambled to make that work. Um, using things like Google Docs and, and those types of programs, we can go across platforms and, and make that work. But of course, there's always going to be a gap between those students and their resources at home. And so um, we, you know, often what we'll do is buy just enough to cover that gap. So maybe I don't have an entire classroom of Chromebooks, but I have enough that I can give one to the kid I know doesn't have a device to bring. And so we are making do, and we're doing great things with what we have. Um, we're, I think we're focusing it very much in the right places, but, uh, but resources are one of the things that does hold us back as well. Really? Well, as I start school on Monday, the biggest barrier, I'll start with that, that we're facing right now is the lack of qualified teachers in the teach, teacher pool. You know, as I began Monday, I have about three vacancies that I've been trying to fill all summer. Um, and it's not that um, I have a, I'm being picky in my selection. I don't have anyone to select from. And so it's the lack of quality teachers. And so one of the... What, what are the three? What are the three? Um, health occupations, um, exceptional children, and now social studies. So, now social studies will be a little bit easier. That one just kind of popped up on me today. Um, but the other two <laughs> have been uh, about summer. But, um, but I say that to say, and I'm the type of person, I'm always about, I'm always proactive, okay, what is the positive? And so what we have found that we, and what we do and what I appreciate about Wells Fargo and what, they're doing, what they have done for me as the principal of the year is reach out to businesses. This is, that, now this is where our hand is out because sometimes we do have to try to provide incentives for teachers to make it worthwhile to make, because we can't pay them necessarily what we know that they're worth but to look locally at what are some discounts we can have for our teachers at our school or in our district, um, but trying to find any type of incentive that we can um, outside the school building to try to attract teachers to our school and to our district. So those are some of, that's, that is probably the biggest challenge that um, I face as a principal, but the solution really is just trying to find ways to invest in the teacher, let them know they're appreciated and valued, especially if you can't necessarily give them the salary that we might desire. I'm going to stay with you for one moment, if I might. Um, I applaud our university system and its partnership with the community college system for their efforts to give us the best teachers they possibly can. However, uh, what are you seeing as a deficiency possibly when you get a brand new teacher just out of the university and uh, they take on that very difficult job in the classroom and they might not be but four or five years older than your, your seniors. Well, you're going to be surprised. I can't remember the last time I hired a teacher that came out of a teacher ed program. The majority of my teachers at the high school level are lateral entry. They're coming out of businesses, um, with, you know, maybe kind of in between careers, so they're just trying to transition. So it is, that's why I say it really is a challenge. So those persons are coming in with the content knowledge, but not necessarily um, the, ped the pedagogy and the educational um, methods that they should know. So they spend a lot of time just trying to learn how to teach in the process of teaching. So. And with lateral entry, and I've talked with many, many lateral entry teachers, as you said, many times they are transitioning in their career. They often don't stay very long. Um, they'll usually stay a couple of years and then they have a very high turnover rate for lateral entry. And so we are seeing, as she said, increased numbers of lateral entry, uh, often because the numbers of, of students enrolled in teacher education programs are just drastically down. The children, young people who are talented and ambitious do not see teaching as a good teacher. And so they're just not entering the, the profession. Dr. Williams. Let me address that. At, in Hope County, we experience a 25% teacher turnover every year based on military and, and some other issues. So we too are faced with value and teachers, which is great. We bring that life experience to a classroom and we need that to expand it. But it's critical that we develop, and I appreciate meetings like this, the human capital need across the board. And that we continue to support leadership development uh, programs that's critical. Uh, the mentors that that we need is just critical for all those components. But funding is critical too. 
every year we continue to see a cut at DPI. That's for the critical positions when we spend 25% of teacher turnover. Uh, again, the leadership within buildings, we need to pay teachers for extra time and develop those teacher leaders. That's important to do that. But to develop that human capital is just critical, and I see it as a priority for this state. And, and where we invest our dollars will really say a lot about what we believe about education and about the future of this state. Uh, you are the exemplars for the roles that you play in education. Uh, you talked about things that are working for you and possibly some barriers that you are confronted with. But uh, Bobby, why are you the state teacher of you? What makes you mean? What makes you mean? What makes you mean different? Absolutely nothing. Uh, there, there is nothing different about me. Uh, if anything, I am talented with words because I've taught English for 17 years. <laughs> That's about it. The truth is, um, and I said this at when I won Gaston County Teacher of the Year, I thought it was the biggest thing that would ever happen in my career. I drove home with my wife saying, this is it. This is fantastic. And I was so thrilled because the four other candidates, we were the finalists for Gaston County Teacher of the Year, had risen above 52 candidates from every school in Gaston County, and every one of them was spectacular. They were gifted, talented, intelligent, hardworking, dedicated, caring teachers. Every one of them was great. And so when I rose to the five, I was absolutely honored. And then when I won among those, I couldn't believe it. Uh, I was up against a woman who had been teaching in our district for 30 years and was a phenomenal science teacher. Everyone I talked to said, oh, she taught me, she's wonderful, she taught my daughter. The fact is, that our schools are jam-packed with talented, outstanding teachers. There's nothing different about me. I, I, the main thing that's different about me is maybe I, I wrote a good essay. <laughs> but if I can, I would like to put a plug in for the humanities. I think that's something we often forget about, but if you see who are the people who rise into leadership roles, they often have backgrounds in the humanities, in, in English with words, or in, in the humanities like history, social studies. Uh, I always say the way we pick our president is by debate. And so rhetoric and writing and speaking, those are important skills, but also those those building of relationships that they learn in, by studying the humanities and studying each other, those are skills that we shouldn't forget about as we focus on manufacturing and STEM. Yeah, a great STEM program does exactly that. It's about literature and math and speaking and defending and writing. Okay. Well, you, what, what's I, different I, about you? Uh, there's nothing different about me. Actually, me and Bobby had something in common. I too am an English teacher, former English teacher, so there must be something to it. Um, but, uh, you know, I echo exactly what he said. There are outstanding principals across the state of North Carolina. I'm just privileged and humbled and honored to have the opportunity to represent all of them. Um, and when I was selected as the Wells Fargo 2016 Principal of the Year this year, I think one of the first things I said it was about my team. It was about the people that I work with. It's never about me because I can't run a high school of over a thousand students by myself, and everyone knows that. So it really is about the team working together. But I will say this, and I think that it's really appropriate for this setting. And later on, after um, you know the selection was made, I did run into a member of the selection committee later, and one of the, she said to me what stood out for her were the, were the partnerships that I, we had created in our school with business. What I shared earlier, that partnership with the military, with Duke Energy, those are the things that impressed her specifically. So I, I think that it just truly echoes why we're here today and what we have to keep doing to move forward. Freddie, in uh, a few words, what's different about you? Um, well, you know, in my colleagues could be on this stage and on that one. What's different about me is that I had the privilege of being educated through the public school system. My father was a high school dropout, my mother finished school, but what they instilled was the value of an education and that that was the door to a career and to a future. Um, what's different is I had a teacher, and all of us have that one teacher that made a difference, that made us believe that we could achieve, that made us believe we could do more than we ever thought that we could do. And I believe that sixth grade teacher, Melissa Shaw, 
who took a personal interest in me. Uh, what's different is I made a commitment to Hope County School. Longevity and leadership to get this work done requires that commitment of time and energy. When I went to Hope 10 years ago, it was on the verge of being taken over. One or two districts considered for that. Uh, that is no longer the case. In a fall A2F grading system, all of our schools met and exceeded growth because of a lot of support of a lot of people around us. Um, our free reduced lunch is 70%, and we don't have a DOF school, and we're excited about that. But what different is that commitment and that calling in my life, in our lives, to be educated. You know, humbleness is a measure of greatness. I think you can see that. We have five minutes left. Are there questions from the audience? If you'd like to direct any one of the three. Yes, ma'am. I'd like to know, since you say that most of the teachers that you're getting are lateral, if y'all have ever considered um, a job shadowing for people in the community to actually see what a teacher does. Um, I actually got that opportunity in my community last year, and it was quite enlightening. Well, some of you probably, did, I'll let you hear the question. The question was, uh, paraphrasing, have you thought about a job shadowing opportunity for those that are considering lateral entry? So they know if they really want to do that or not. <laughs> I'm not in charge of that level of my pay grade, but I would be absolutely thrilled to have anyone come in. Um, we welcome anyone, especially I do, welcome absolutely anyone to come in and watch me teach, whether that's um, students in college, that's what I often get, we're asking, um, but community members, anybody. I We do also in the spring a um, invite a legislator into the classroom so they can actually watch us and see what we do. That's a fantastic idea, though. I really do that. Especially for your, your, your teacher that you were talking about with um, CTE. Yes. Yeah, that's what he and I share. That's a great idea, so we'll definitely take that back. We have a teacher cadet program where students identify early on that they want to teach, and so we provide those opportunities for shadowing um, through the regular school day and with that. Um, and it's been extremely successful for kids. One of the issues, though, is we need to elevate education and educators to the level. It's life-changing work, and what you need to be paid for that and do that way. So we have some work to do in terms of how educators are viewed. One other question, and uh, in the deep back. Yeah, thank you. Um, the question I have really is probably more of a curriculum-related uh, question, but I, w I welcome your thoughts. I'm pretty heavily involved here in Wake County at the high school as well as community college level from a business advisory board perspective. So I'm, I'm, I'm representing business in, in a pretty broad industry uh, for uh, the company I work with, uh, Manpower Group. So we uh, represent a, a very, very diverse workforce demand population. My question is around uh, project-based learning. In the high schools that I'm involved with uh, here in Wake County, uh, the curriculum is very much project-based learning, PDL-based, the early college high school system. Uh, and, and I think uh, statewide, you can't question the results that are coming out of those programs uh, from you know the, uh, just the overall academic scores and, and the futures that they're providing both to go on to higher education as well as engaging in the workforce. So my question is, how do we, if we, if we can kind of see that, those results from PDL-based curriculum, what is it going to take to inject that across uh, the more traditional high schools that really aren't focused on PBL, because we see uh, you know, your, your point about engaging businesses in the classroom, it's a big, big part of what we're doing uh, you know, at Wake Stem Early College High School, is getting the businesses in the classrooms, co-teaching, and whatnot. It's making a difference from relevance. It's relevance in the workforce, it's relevance for the students and the educators. So PBL is really the question of how do we get it across uh, all curriculum across the state? That's a great question. Hope County, we're involved with SRD, the Southern Region Education Board. 
Um, they have a new initiative, Advanced Careers, that really addresses that issue. Um, how do we upgrade uh, career tech for education? How do we ready those labs to 21st century equipment, that type that kids can actually have hands on and PBL become a reality of that? The emphasis on STEM, not just at the middle and the high school, but an emphasis also on elementary. So in hope, we have elementary students already involved in coding. They love it, the robotics club, those kinds of things, I think, address that. We also, at the same time, have a major initiative to train our teachers in PBL, um, make sure that we design lessons with hands-on experience, extended learning opportunity, the research, and all that. So it's a new area for a lot of uh, districts in terms of how to be ready to ready kids for careers. But PBL is a part of that. But for us, it's through the Southern Region Education Board and advanced careers. And working backwards, uh, what should an engineer program look like, and can we match that with the job that we want to be available within our county? So a lot of work. One last word, key to success is? Make sure that you're trustworthy and you keep your credibility. And you know, Colin Powell said in his 18 course of leadership that the essence of leadership is trust. And if people trust you, they will follow you if even out of curiosity. <laughs> Going with that, yeah, my answer was going to be relationships. We, we talk so much about the curriculum and the testing and whether we should do this curriculum or that curriculum or the standards, but the truth is if there's not a caring teacher in that classroom that the students trust and that the students believe have their best interest in mind, all the best intentions of curriculum and training all fall apart. Really? Get involved. Identify school, get involved, work together. We have to all work side by side to make education work for our students. So find a school and get involved. Let's give the three panelists. Thank all the three of you for your comments and we're one minute and 18 seconds over our time. Thank you.